to talk about a lot of ideas in this video, but the reason we're doing so many ideas together at one time is that these ideas are all related to each other. So we're going to emphasize those relationships. So we have several definitions here. First one is it's independent of path and conservative vector field. All right, so I'm just going to draw some pictures that kind of illustrate what this definition is saying. Let C be a curve from point A to point B. So the line integral, the integral over C of F dot dr. So it's important to note that this is not just any line integral. This is a work integral. It is said to be independent of paths on an open region D containing C. So we'll just draw some region, open region D containing our curve C. If the value of this integral is the same for every curve from every fixed point A to every fixed point B in the region D. So what this is saying is that if I have the same answer when I do the path that I drew or some other path and I evaluate the work integral along that path or some other path or some other path as long as I'm staying within the region D if I start at A and end at B, if I get the same value for the work integral along all of those paths, as long as I stay in the region D, and that happens no matter what fixed points A and B I choose in my region D, then we say that that work integral is independent of path. So one way that that could be helpful to you is if, if you're evaluating a work integral and you know that it's going to be independent of path, then you could choose a simpler path than the one you're given. Uh, and in this case, we say the vector field F is a conservative vector field. So that word conservative comes from physics and it has to do with conservation of energy. It's important to note that not every vector field has this property where the work integrals are independent of path. If that were true in every vector field, then we wouldn't need a special definition for certain kinds of vector fields where that happens. A lot of the kinds of vector fields that you deal with in physics, not all, but a lot of the vector fields that you deal with in physics have this property. Gravitational fields, electromagnetic fields are conservative vector fields, so they have this property. So you may have learned some things about work integrals in those types of vector fields. That is helpful when you're in those kinds of vector fields, but you want to be careful not to apply those when you're not necessarily in a conservative vector field. One other important thing about this, if I'm in a conservative vector field, that that work integral would be the same for every path from fixed point A to fixed point B. And that would also include the path where A and B are the same point. So I have a closed loop. And in that case, the work integral would be the same for every path from A to B, including the path where you don't actually go anywhere. And so if you are in a conservative vector field, then the work integral along a closed path will be zero. I did use some notation here that I don't think I have used before. When I put this little circle on the line integral sign, that is to emphasize that the curve must be closed. So you could certainly have a closed curve even if you don't have the circle there, but when you see the circle there, that's to emphasize that your curve is closed. So its starting point and ending point are the same point. All right, so what this basically says is it would be really handy to know if you're working in a conservative vector field and you're doing a work integral because in a conservative vector field, if you're doing a work integral, one option might be to choose a simpler path from point A to point B and evaluate the work integral over that path. Another option might be if you have a closed path in a conservative vector field, then your work integral is going to be zero. So you just note that and go on to the next problem. So the next couple things we're going to look at help us determine whether we have a conservative vector field or not. All right, so we have a couple more definitions here. Uh, one of them is related to something that we've done before. We talked about gradient fields. This says that if capital F is a gradient field for some function little f, then we call that little f a potential function for f. So in some sense, this potential function is a little bit like an antiderivative. Remembering that if f is a gradient vector field, then that means that this f has components that are partial derivatives. So if that is true, then we call that little f a potential function. So in some sense, it would be an antiderivative, but with respect to x, y, and Z. 
All right, so two important questions. How do we determine if capital F is a gradient field or not? And if it is, how do we find that potential function? And then the third question might be, why do we care about finding the potential function? That's in that fundamental theorem of line integrals. Okay, so there is a theorem here. That says that if my vector field F has component functions that have continuous first partial derivatives on a simply connected region, then F is a gradient field and this is an if and only if statement which means that the implication works both ways so if I know one side I get the other and if I know the other side I get the first side uh, so F is a gradient field so again that would be saying that F is the gradient of some potential function little f if and only if and then there are all these partial derivatives that are equal to each other our textbook calls this theorem the component test for determining whether you have a gradient field. But we have actually introduced some notation that makes it a little bit easier to check this. So another way to say this is to say that the curl vector is the zero vector, not just at a point, but at every point in this region. Okay, just a couple of comments about what it means to be a simply connected region. A uh, simply connected region basically means if I have a region and I have two points, that I can find a path that goes from point A to point B and totally stays within the region and that there are no holes in the region. Holes in a region would make it not simply connected. So all of our two, for example, would be a simply connected region. The region inside a circle of radius one would be a simply connected region. If you just think about this a little bit, if your F is a gradient field, then its components are partial derivatives. And so those are my m, n, and p functions. And so in that case, these derivatives that I'm finding over here would actually be second derivatives of that little f. So the partial derivative with respect to y of m would be del del y of del f del x and del n del x would be del del x of n, which is del f del y. And so that is also a mixed second partial derivative, but with the derivatives taken in the opposite order. And we know from Clairaut's theorem from a couple chapters ago that provided all those partial derivatives are continuous, all those second partial derivatives are continuous, we would expect these two to be equal. Okay, so that explains why the implication works this way. All right, so in answer to this first question, how do we determine if F is a gradient field or not? One way to do that is to check to see if the curl vector is zero. And then the second part here, if F is a gradient field, how do we find a potential function little f? Okay, so we're gonna look at an example and just kind of think that through here. All right, so I'm gonna write down a vector field here that is a gradient field, we will verify that it is. So to check to see if this is a gradient field, we're gonna check to see if the curl vector is zero. And I can go ahead and set up my matrix to calculate that curl vector, but I'm gonna do something that I often do when I calculate these. And I'm just gonna write my del del x, del del y, del del z, right above these components. And then I can imagine the rest of the matrix and just do my little cross products that I need to do here. Just saves a little bit of writing. Uh, okay, so for my curl vector in the I component, I will have del del y of the P function, x, y, cosine z plus z, minus del del z of the N function. So del del z of x sine z. And then in the J component, remember the minus sign that goes in front for your j component. And then I will have del del x of the p function minus del del z of the m function. And so again, we get zero in that component. And then in the k component, I will have del del x of x sine z minus del del y of y sine z. So I also get zero in that component. So that curl vector is zero. So that tells us that our capital F vector field is a gradient field. All right, so if I wanna find my potential function, little f, I need to remember that these component functions in my vector field f are really partial derivatives. So this first component function 
would have been a partial derivative of little f with respect to x. So in order to recover that little f, I just need to undo the differentiation. So my little f function is going to be the antiderivative of y sine z with respect to x. So I'm just undoing the partial derivative with respect to x with a partial integration with respect to x. So when I integrate that with respect to x, I'll get x, y, sine z, plus any terms that would have disappeared when I differentiated with respect to x. So any terms that do not involve x, any terms that did not involve x when I differentiated with respect to x would have become zero. So I wouldn't be able to recover those. We might write that as g of y, z. So a function of just y and z, perhaps. I don't mind you writing it in words, that's perfectly fine. And then in order to make sure that I recover everything involving y, I need to basically do the same thing with the j component of my f, remembering that it was a partial derivative with respect to y. So I'll get x, y, sine z, plus any terms not involving y. Notice that I have recovered the same term twice. Any terms that involve both x and y should have shown up in both of these. When I find my antiderivative with respect to x, I will recover all the terms involving x. When I find my antiderivative with respect to y, I'll recover all the terms involving y. If you have any terms that involve both, you should recover that twice. That doesn't mean there are two of those terms in your answer. It just means you've got some redundancy there in your work. All right, and so I should expect also to recover that term again when I undo my derivative with respect to z because that term involves x, y, and z. Uh, you do need to make sure you check all of them though because this one also has an additional term that I will recover. Okay, so I recovered that term that involved all three variables all three times. That's a good way to check that you are really working with a vector field that does have a potential function. And then any terms that involve only one or two variables, you'll only recover in one or two of these. So the other term that I recovered was this term that only involved z. The only terms that I would not recover in all three of those would be any terms that don't involve x, y, or z, so constant terms. So this represents actually all of the potential functions. If I only need a potential function, then you can choose a specific value of c that you like, or maybe there's some other information that helps you figure out what the c value is. Okay, so then the big deal question is, why do you care? Why do you want a potential function? Fundamental theorem of line integrals is what connects all of that. So let's look at this theorem. So fundamental theorem of line integrals is what connects all of these ideas we've been talking about in this video. All right, so let's look at this. Let C be a piecewise smooth curve determined by R of T from point A to point B. All right, so we've already talked about that. Let F equals MNP be a vector field with the components having continuous first partial derivatives throughout an open simply connected region D containing C. All right, we've talked about all of those ideas. All right, then this first part here says F is a gradient field if and only if F is conservative on D. So F being a gradient field means that our capital F is the gradient of some potential function, little f. We had a previous theorem that told us how to check that we could check to see if the curl vector is zero everywhere. And this theorem then says that if either of those is true, we get the implication that F is conservative on D. So that definition was what we started with, and it is about work integrals, it tells us that the work integral is path independent throughout our region. So essentially, the first part of this theorem gives us a way to connect the idea about how do we tell if we have a path independent work integral or a conservative vector field. And one way to do that would be to check to see if your curl vector is zero. And in this case, this last part is why this is called the fundamental theorem of line integrals. This should look a lot like the fundamental theorem of calculus the left end here, we have a work integral, which we know is independent of path in a conservative vector field. And it says that that is equal to this little f. 
This little f is the potential function. Remember, that's like an antiderivative evaluated at the endpoints, at the ending point minus the starting point. So this looks a lot like the fundamental theorem of calculus that you've been using a lot since Calc 1. Okay, so we had an example of a vector field that we already talked about showing was a gradient field. All right, so we showed that this vector field has a curl vector that is always zero. So that told us that the vector field is a gradient field for some function, little f, some potential function. And then we undid those partial derivatives to find our potential function. So now if I want to calculate the work done by this vector field as an object moves along a curve, knowing that my vector field is conservative tells us that my work integral is path independent. So I have several choices about how I can evaluate that work integral. I could evaluate the work integral over the path that I'm given. That actually is a little bit difficult if you try to do that. I could choose an easier path from point A to point B. That's not too hard, but it is going to involve several steps. Or the easiest way to do this problem is I can use the fundamental theorem of line integrals. So I'm going to just abbreviate that. And I'm going to evaluate little f of B, that would be my terminal point, minus little f of A. So I need to think about my terminal point. That would be where I'm at on this curve when t is equal to 2 pi. That would be my point B. And then I need to think about my initial point. That would be where I'm at on the curve when t equals 0. Those are both pretty easy to find. Okay, so I used my potential function that we found earlier in this video. I've just plugged in my point 1, 0, 2 pi and my point 1, 0, 0 and then I'm going to subtract. So this is the part that should feel like fundamental theorem of calculus that you did in calculus one. Uh, so here it looks like I'll get two pi plus c minus c or two pi. And one important thing to note here, just like when you use antiderivatives and fundamental theorem of calculus in calc one to evaluate definite integrals, your constants will cancel. So a lot of times I will just use a potential function and choose the constant to be zero because those constants would cancel in your subtraction using fundamental theorem of line integrals anyway. All right, so this provides a great shortcut when it applies. The thing to be cautious about would be trying to apply this when it does not apply. Remember that you need to check to see that you have a conservative vector field before you can use this theorem.